Hey, I'm Cody from LVVTA, and today we're here with Andrew. What's this rig that you've got here set up today? Yeah, so this is a EPAS rig that we've constructed, and this is what we've built to help train certifiers and, and also to learn ourselves. What we've been seeing is that over the years that a lot of the EPAS systems have been installed incorrectly in modified vehicles. What is EPAS itself? EPAS is an abbreviation of electronic power assist steering. So, and we, we call it EPAS um, as, as just its nickname that we have and everyone knows it. And basically what it is, is an electric motor uh, coupled to a reduction gearbox. It takes your input for, as the driver and it amplifies it to the output. So giving assistance. So what's this uh, contraption you got here with the two steering wheels? Does it come out of a car or something? Yeah, so this here, um, funnily enough, we had to, we, we were kind of brainstorming and we were wondering like what's the best way to explain the, the amount of force that these things produce. And most people, they learn by hands-on. So as part of the certifier training tool, um, we, we came up with this idea to attach a steering wheel to both sides of it. So we can have one, one guy on the input and one guy on the output and we can actually get a real world feel for how much torque they actually produce so it's all good kind of telling them that it produces X amount of torque, but it's just a number and, and you don't actually know what that is until you feel it. So if you want to actually just jump on that there and I'll, you try and hold on to that as tight as you can and I'll just use my finger and you'll see how much how power that puts out. So, well, so I'm just not even trying. So, geez. So that's quite impressive. Yeah, that's pretty strong, eh? Yeah. Jeez. So um, how did EPAS first originate and what sort of cars do you find them in? So they, they've been around for a long, long time. So they actually originated in the 80s and their first production car, it was in 1989. It was Mitsubishi that actually had the first EPAS system. So what we're finding is that modifiers are actually being able to purchase these from wreckers or as an aftermarket company. They're, they're becoming so cheap that you can pick up like, the, like this one here was $100. So they're, they're finding their way into a lot of modified cars now. And we just need to make sure that the, um, the installation of them is done correctly. So how does EPAS actually work? So we've got a unit here that we've actually got in pieces. And this is one that we, um, we use to demonstrate to our certifiers during training. So this here is the, the reduction housing, which is this piece you can see here. Um, the, the motor is here, but we just don't have it attached at the moment. And this here is the reduction gear, and this is the output shaft, so that, that would live in there. And then we've got the input shaft, which would be down in there. So there's not too many pieces to it. It's kind of very similar to like a wiper motor. Yeah, so these, these two shafts are mechanically coupled together with this non-circular, like double D style connection. If you can see in there, and then this will go on there. And you can see the slight amount of tolerance that the, the manufacturer has, has machined into there. And so what we've got here is a torsion rod that actually connects these two shafts together as well. What's a torsion rod for? So the torsion rod is a, is a spring. And then, so the way that the, the two shafts are actually fastened together, uh, they're in their midpoint, and the torsion bar is always trying to allow them to, to uh, spring back to centre. And it's that, that force that's applied by the driver to the input shaft is flexing that torsion bar, and then we have a sensor that detects that misalignment of the two shafts. And then that sensor sends its signal to the control unit, which is what we've got here. And then that in turn powers the motor and then the motor is connected to the output. So basically the, the more force the driver puts on the input shaft, the more this torsion bar twists, the more the sensor reads that the two shafts are becoming misaligned. And then the more power is applied to the motor to try and allow the output to catch up to the input. So essentially it's always trying to to uh, straighten itself out and get itself into an equilibrium. So it's, it's pretty much how it works. Well, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that.
So you mentioned these uh, units over here. Where do you get these from? Yeah, so the electronic controller, typically they'll just come from the wrecker when people were just buying these. So like this one here was, was just purchased from the wrecker, came with that one. Um, they are also available like aftermarket. So this one here is actually pretty cool. This one's got the ability to actually adjust the assistance that it has. And it also has a, a wheel speed controller. So um, it can ramp up or down the, the amount of assistance based on, on the vehicle speed, which is, which is really good. So they're really simple, but we just need to make sure that people wire them safely. So what do you mean safely? The, the manufacturer's instructions should always be followed for, for cable sizing and fusing. Um, if you don't have an aftermarket one and you've removed it from the donor vehicle, like this one here, um, you should always look at the fuse that the donor vehicle used and the cable sizing and make sure that's that's matched. So, so you don't just use a bigger wire? No, 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 no speaker wire. So what's the benefits of EPAS units and why are people using them? So yeah, they've got many benefits. Um, first of all, they're so compact. Um, so a lot of a lot of builders, hot rodders and, and guys like that, they just love them because they can just fit them under their dash and you can't see them. So that's 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 one benefit. Um, the other thing is the efficiency. So there's no pump being driven from the motor. There's no fluid, no hydraulics. So guys that have got high performance cars, um, they really love that, especially race cars and things. There's no fluid overheating, um, all those kind of issues that you'd see. So what's this unit over here that you have? Yeah, so this one here, this one's a uh, Toyota Press column. So the interesting thing about this one is that we've got a torque meter on the input and then a torque meter on the output. So we did that so we can, we can see uh, just how much assistance this one's actually giving. The, the, the key thing with this one, as you can see here, we've got this load cell and we've mounted it in the position, the same, the same position that Toyota had mounted it. And what we're doing here is using the load cell to measure um, how many kilos of force is actually acting on this bracket. So if I move the steering wheel, you can see with just a very small amount of input. So we're getting over about 100 kilos of force negative and positive. So there's quite a lot of force there. So the force produced from this EPATS unit, what could you compare it to? Yeah, so the, the reaction force that's kind of happening here, um, I guess you can imagine if you're using a cordless drill and then and the drill gets jammed and it tries to rip itself out of your hand, it's kind of that same force, but this is trying to tear itself from out underneath the dash. And we can see there with that, extreme amount of weight, it was over 100 kilos. You imagine like a 100 kilo person on a little bracket, that's how much force these, these brackets have to hold. So how should I mount one of these things? Would a column drop be good for mounting an EPAS unit underneath the dash or? That's pretty much one of the reasons why we constructed this whole test rig was to, um, to actually learn for ourselves and to teach our certifiers just how important it is to actually mount. So a column drop itself wouldn't be enough. Um, they are normally typically just clamped around the, the upper end of the column. And it's that, that reaction force that we just demonstrated down here is the thing that needs to be supported. So if you were going to mount one, um, the, the, if you were using a donor vehicle, the best thing would be to look at the, the, the vehicle that it came from. So in this, in this case here, this one's actually out of a, um, it's a Toyota as well. This was a newer Ackler. Um, so what we've done here is we've basically mimicked what the, the OE have done um, using this, this, this main bracket off of the casing. They, they utilize like a big dash bar, so that's why we've, we've kind of simulated a dash bar um, and then the, uh, the rest of the column there. So if you don't have this exact type setup, something similar to like this one, it will have like bosses incorporate into the frame of the casing, the motor casing. It's, it's a really good idea to use as many bolts as you can around that and make a nice solid bracket that comes off perpendicular to the, to the actual steering shaft itself. So now that you've touched on the mounting of the EPAS unit, what would I attach it to underneath the dash? Yeah, so um, if you've if you've built um, a vehicle 
and it may be like a scratch built vehicle or an older car, it's probably not going to have a dash bar like this. Um, so we really would like to see um, some, some decent structure that spans across underneath the dash and it's actually incorporated into, into some um, strong parts of the vehicle. If you're, if you're in doubt, you just ask your LVB certifier for advice. But the, um, the main thing is it just has to be fit for purpose and, and no deflection um, and, and, and making sure that all of the, the plate thicknesses, the bolts and everything is, is up to the task. So now that you've touched on how to correctly mount an e-batch unit, how have people been incorrectly mounting the e-batch units? Yeah, well, we've seen a lot that have been really poorly mounted. And again, that was the reason for constructing this whole test rig. So you can see this last example we've got here. We basically built this one to demonstrate how not to mount one. Um, you can see here we've got two separate brackets, which are pretty typical to what you'd see if someone was trying to just accomplish this, like in their backyard, and they may not have the correct tools or materials or know-how. Um, and, and this is the kind of issue that we'd see. So I can power this one up and just demonstrate how this one's going to try and you know, tear itself apart. Wow, that's pretty crazy, eh? Would you say that you have to use a one-piece bracket? Um, yeah, it's definitely preferred. Um, the, the, the real key is, is making sure that it can't parallelogram like multiple pieces it will try and move. So having a nice thick single piece bracket is obviously going to be preferred. Yeah, cool. So now that you've touched base on how to correctly mount an EPAS unit and how to incorrectly mount an EPAS unit, how do you go about doing all the shaft connections? So in our car construction manual, there's a chapter, the steering chapter, and inside that chapter, there is a bunch of recipes on, on how to make those shaft connections. So um, you can find that on our website and it's free to download. Cool. Now, one last question, welding steering shafts, is that okay? No, no, that's not okay. So this one here was um, one I welded, but this is just a, just a training tool. So um, no, absolutely not. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew, for showing the steering rig setup that you've got here today. It's helped me learn quite a fair bit about how to mount e-passes, the power that they put out, and yeah, just stuff that I didn't know before. Hopefully this can steer you guys in the right direction of how to install an e-pass unit correctly at home when you're doing it in your garage. From us here at LVVTA, that's all I've got, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>